uh, as registrar. It doesn't seem like it's been that long yet. Um, and as I prepared to come here, I discovered that Kirk Nelson was in New Bedford too, as director of the New Bedford Museum of Glass. And that was really cool because I met Kirk, I probably was introduced to Kirk uh, in the spring of 1982 when I was interviewing uh, for the Winter Tour program in early American culture. He was a student in the program then, and I, I attended there. So uh, we were there together for a year, and uh, the, the museum world is pretty small, uh, but I quickly discovered that Kirk was the only person in the program at the time who was a glass person. And for any of you who, uh, they're enthusiasts in every field, obviously Scrimshaw is one that's important here, furniture, but you know, glass people are special, they're really intense. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Kirk was the intense one in, in uh, the Winter Tour program when I was there. We've, uh, we've crossed paths several times since then, and sometimes in strange places, at, uh, in Stevens Point, Wisconsin, actually, <laughs> when he was uh, curating a, an exhibit of early American press goblets from the Dorothy and Jacques Vallier collection, and I was working at the Wisconsin Historical Society down the state from there. And, uh, and then I think a, earlier in Sandwich, he, He's uh, gone to most of the places where you would expect glass people to go. He was curator of the Sandwich Glass Museum. Uh, he uh, curated, was curator of the Bennington Museum. He, you know, uh, they do have a really good glass collection, but he might have been slumming a little bit with all that <laughs> ceramics. <laughs> um, and then, and then he came to New Bedford uh, to uh, to start the New Bedford Museum of Glass. Uh, it was the successor to the Glass Arts Center in Brad, that had been in Bradford, Massachusetts, and sort of indirectly a successor to the New Bedford Glass Museum. Uh, and this evening, he's going to uh, speak to us about New Bedford Glass and its context. And welcome, Kurt Nelson. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. When we were at uh, Winter Tour in 83, the uh, program holds a, they have a, an annual spring trip and uh, every other year they go north to uh, Newport, Rhode Island and then out to the Cape and on alternate years they go down, to, um, down south. And the year we came north, um, we stopped in uh, New Bedford. We had a wonderful presentation from Dick Kugler, uh, then director of the Whaling Museum. And then our long-haired, wild, uh, 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 hippie uh, decorative arts savant leader uh, Bob St. George took the whole group of 20 fellows to uh, Freestones for dinner. Um, so this is many years ago and it's so interesting how cyclical things are, of course, never imagining then that careers would, would come back to New Bedford. Um, I want to thank the Whaling Museum and the old Dartmouth Historical Society for inviting me to participate in the reinstallation of the glass collection here. It's scheduled to open in September of this year uh, to coincide with a couple of exciting um, events. The Mount Washington and Pierpoint Glass Society is going to hold their annual convention here um, as part of the symposium that's being organized by the, uh, by the Whaling Museum. And we're going to run a bus trip that Saturday morning of that weekend down to Cape Cod to go to the All Glass Antique Show in Sandwich, which is one of the great um, glass collecting events in New England. They have about 50 dealers who specialize just in glass, uh, but all types. And you'll see, um, you'll see some great New Bedford glass down there, as well as Sandwich and Contemporary and, and Art Glass. Um, so look for uh, announcements and information about that because it's going to be it's going to be a great event. Um, uh, due to the um, efforts of Dick Kugler, uh, former director here, and uh, the curatorial staff, uh, Louis St. Alban, who. Uh, was a leading authority on New Bedford glass. He had an antique shop here in New Bedford on North Water Street. And many other individuals, the Old Dartmouth Historical Society has 
developed an outstanding collection of, of New Bedford glass. Many of the pieces from the museum here were illustrated in Ken Wilson's two volume study, Mount Washington and Pearpoint Glass. We see volume one from this uh, on the screen. Volume two was just published by the Corning Museum uh, last year. And the Whaling Museum was one of several institutions that were really instrumental in bringing this research to the public, uh, both through their support of Ken Wilson, who was uh, certainly the leading scholar in, uh, of New Bedford Glass, a former curator of Corning, the Henry Ford Museum, the Toledo Museum, um, and also in their funding of this publication. Ken started his book on New Bedford back in, I think, 1958. And he worked on it throughout his career. Uh, and it was through the efforts of the Whaling Museum, the Mount Washington uh, Glass Society, uh, the Chrysler Museum, and Corning that this lifetime of publication of, of, of research was brought to, um, to the public's uh, attention and to access a really um, exciting development for us because New Bedford Glass is collected throughout the world. It's recognized as probably the leading art glass uh, production center in the United States in the 19th century. And uh, work like the book by Ken Wilson and museum installations and other publications are, are serving to bring this glass to the attention of a much broader public. And of course, that's, um, that's a, um, a a goal that we are all um, all pursuing. Now tonight I'm going to survey the uh, the history of, of uh, New Bedford glass. I'm going to be showing pieces both from uh, the Whaling Museum's collection and from the collection of the new uh, the new glass museum. I'll say a, a few things about the new museum. We opened a year ago, September, we're in the Wamsutta Mill complex uh, sharing space with the New Bedford Antique Center. Uh, we were originally incorporated as the Glass Arts Center uh, in 1993 at Bradford College in Haverhill. And when Bradford, when the college closed about 10 years ago, Louis St. Alban, again the, the local um, antiques dealer and, and, and glass authority, was on our board of trustees and Ken Wilson was serving as our vice president at the time. And Louis encouraged us to relocate to come um, to New Bedford and set up a glass museum that covered the entire history of glass. So unlike the earlier glass museum, we cover everything from ancient to contemporary. Uh, we've just received a wonderful bequest of contemporary glass uh, from an estate in New York, uh, in, uh, in Boston, uh, pieces that we've already installed. And this being the 50th anniversary of the um, studio glass movement, it's an appropriate and timely um, development for us. So let me start here. There we go. This is a uh, bird's eye print showing the old uh, Mount Washington glass factory. The Original Mount Washington Glass Factory was founded in South Boston in, 19, in 1837. And it was called the Mount Washington Factory because the little hill behind where the factory was built was jokingly referred to as Mount Washington by the locals. Uh, so in 1870, they heard that there was a brand new factory building here in uh, New Bedford that, uh, that was vacant and looking for new owners. Um, it had been built just a few years earlier by um, glass blowers, uh, glass makers from Sandwich who had come to New Bedford, set, the, set up the factory and then almost immediately failed. So the Mount Washington factory relocated to New Bedford from uh, South Boston and um, they found this to be a very, very um, well-suited location um, right on the water where they could uh, ship in uh, um, fuel, uh, coal, uh, ship out glass, and um, the, factory, uh, the factory immediately prospered. <clears throat> Sorry. 
In the early 1870s, um, this gentleman, Frederick Shirley, uh, came to New Bedford originally uh, from England to run the chandelier department. He was a very uh, business savvy um, fellow and when the company reorganized in 1874, uh, Shirley uh, essentially took over the, the leadership of the company. Uh, he was responsible for introducing many of the uh, highly uh, decorative Victorian art glasses that um, New Bedford is famous for, uh, introduced in the 18, late 1870s and 1880s, and we'll be seeing uh, a number of those um, uh, later on in the, um, in the talk. At the time the factory, uh, or the, the company, opened their exhibit at the Centennial, um, Centennial Exhibition down in Philadelphia in 1876. They had published a trade card, uh, Mount Washington Glassworks, you can see uh, the name, with the two glass blowing putti, one of the uh, really endearing images in, in American glass history. Um, and this was the time when the company changed their name. They incorporated and became the Mount Washington Glass Company. So they had to redo their, uh, their trade card. And you can see where it says Mount Washington Glassworks across the top. In the revised version, it now says Mount Washington Glass Company. Uh, they also made one other change to the design and it's an indication of, um, I guess, a different uh, period. And um, I will show you a close-up where the only other change was the strategic uh, location of the shade, the glass shade here. <laughs> Apparently, someone must have objected to that first version. and. Uh, so I can show this one to you without blushing. Mount Washington won a uh, medal at the Centennial Exhibit. The Centennial Exhibit was the first uh, World's Fair that did not offer gold, silver, and bronze medals. Um, if you were recognized for the um, quality of your, uh, your display, you received a bronze medal. And we think this was probably because the centennial, uh, the, the exhibit not only was a World's Fair, but it was celebrating the centennial of the host country. And the American organizers of the fair were probably concerned that a lot of the gold and silver medals would go to Europe. So they leveled the playing field. Uh, a number of the uh, more important uh, European companies uh, refused to come over because of that. Um, but uh, Mount Washington did receive a medal. Uh, they were very proud of it. They featured it in a lot of their advertising. You can see it here. Um, again, Shirley was, was very savvy in this, uh, in this area. Uh, he had the medals on his stationery. And we have from the family, from the Shirley family, a couple of wonderful images of the Centennial exhibit. And this one shows the fountain, the all glass fountain that the fair built, uh, that the uh, Mount Washington Glass Company um, erected. Ken Wilson, when he published volume one of his book, had a wonderful description by a visitor to the fair of this fountain. But Ken had never seen a photograph, a surviving photograph of the, um, of the fountain. So when this turned up a few years after he passed away, uh, we brought it to the attention of the Corning Museum of Glass, and it's now been published in volume two. Uh, the original, the description reads, one of the most beautiful objects in the main building was a crystal fountain, which every visitor to the building must have noticed, and what was designed and exhibited by the Mount Washington Glass Company. This fountain, 48 feet in circumference and 17 feet high, was built entirely of prisms of cut glass, which reflected the changing light and decomposed it into all the colors of the rainbow. It was so arranged that at night it could be lighted up by 120 gas jets concealed within, 
And then, with soft, dazzling colors reflected from the countless drops of water and flashing from the glittering prisms, it presented a spectacle of fairy beauty almost beyond imagination. The fountain was surmounted by the largest crystal figure ever made, a Statue of Liberty 30 inches in height and without imperfection. And the Statue of Liberty part is um, under the dome uh, and standing on that glass um, ball or sphere. Uh, you can't make it out very well, but you can see the silhouette of the figure. Remember that the actual Statue of Liberty was a gift from the country of France to the United States. Um, and it was intended to be finished in 1876, but at this point they only had the arm and the, the hand and the torch. So those were sent to the Centennial, and you could actually pay a little admission charge and go up into the arm. Uh, so the Statue of Liberty was, was something that people were thinking about at the time and aware of, and obviously surely incorporated it into this, uh, into this great uh, creation. Here's a close-up. You can see the, uh, the figure of the, st of the Statue of Liberty a little more clearly here. We know that Shirley tried to sell uh, this fountain to the fair organizers because the fair did not close after 1876. It became a, a tourist attraction and continued to operate. Uh, we have the letter uh, written by the fair company to him declining the purchase. And we imagine that it was probably disassembled and sent back to New Bedford and maybe used to make chandelier parts and, and that sort of thing. This is the glass fountain that was shown at the Crystal Palace exhibit in London in 1851. And Frederick Shirley was a, a young boy at that time, but it's uh, likely that he probably saw the fair and saw this fountain, and it might be something that uh, um, gave him the idea to uh, create something spectacular for his exhibit down in, in Philadelphia. Here is another fantastic photograph that survives from the Shirley family showing the other display booth that was uh, organized by the Mount Washington Glass Company. And the noteworthy, uh, most notable uh, object here is that glass table on the far left side of the screen. Again, uh, Ken Wilson had a great description from a contemporary visitor to the exhibit of this table but he had never seen a photograph of it. And this also has been published in volume two uh, of the Mount Washington and Pearpoint book. The original description reads, the Mount Washington glassworks have ingeniously interested all female eyes by placing at the very beginning of their exhibit a lovely toilet table made entirely from crystal. The legs are upright scrolls of solid glass these support a thick slab on whose undersurface geometric forms were cut and then coated with quicksilver so that the top of the table makes hundreds of little mirrors. From either side rise handsomely ornamented standards and between them swings the loveliest plate glass mirror. A border of glass blossoms has been fastened within the edge so ingeniously that they seem to grow there. On the table are two jewel cases to show the skill of their engraver. There is a centennial goblet exquisitely decorated with writhing vines and festooned cords. On an open space, a monogram has been cut, while on a, on, in the corresponding opening, there is a perfect picture of the old independence bell, crack and all. There is a local newspaper uh, description of this table being exhibited in one of the uh, storefronts of New Bedford after the fair. So we know that this made its way back to New Bedford, but we have no idea where it is now. Uh, so keep your eyes open for that as you're going through the antique smalls out there. Hopefully that will turn up. But at least now we have the photograph that shows the, uh, uh, shows the table. Another very interesting object that turns up in this uh, photograph 
is down at the foot of the glass table. Just to the right, you can see a, an hourglass shaped form down there. See it a, a little better here. And then there it is um, enlarged. This is uh, what one of these examples looks like. Um, uh, it, it's a table fountain. And it was patented in 1871. Uh, it was an English patent. The uh, rights were purchased by the Tufts Company in Boston. And Tufts uh, assembled these. Uh, it has the 1871 patent mark and the Tufts name. They were a, a soda fountain company and sold. Uh, but Tufts did not have a glass factory. So there are about a dozen of these known. We had assumed that the glass was probably made at the Boston and Sandwich factory uh, because they did very similar cut patterns to this and they had an office in Boston. Or possibly the New England Glass Company in East Cambridge, which also did very similar work. Mount Washington was not really a contender on our list. Um, but discovering the photograph of these fountains um, on display in the Mount Washington booth in the Centennial uh, moves us um, rather high up on the list now. And we think that the glass for these fountains was probably made in Mount Washington. Um, it could very well be that when the Mount Washington Company was still in South Boston in the late 60s, they established a relationship with the Tufts Company and that that was uh, one of the reasons that they had them uh, produce these globes. Uh, the way these work, uh, if you have water in the lower globe and you rotate it to the top position, it goes through a little channel in the center, uh, the center uh, metal piece there, up through the hollow tube, and then squirts up in a jet about eight inches high. As the water falls back, now I know this sounds impossible, it's water flowing uphill and there's gravity and other considerations, but um, as the water falls back into the basin, it's carried by a little bleed hole down the other side of the tubing and fills the bottom. Um, these uh, play for about 15 minutes. And when the new glass museum had their opening um, last year, uh, the mayor came down and instead of doing a ribbon cutting ceremony, we had him start up the fountain. Uh, very exciting. When we first acquired this, uh, we had been assured that it worked. We unscrewed the lower globe and filled it with water, rotated it to the top, and nothing happened. And it took a little, uh, a little work. Uh, when we tracked down the original patent, it said that you have to fill them from the top. And the reason is that it, it requires the water pressure, the, the, the air pressure generated by the weight of the water in the basin to give just a little extra push to that water um, and to push it through the tubes and create the fountain. Here's the uh, Corning Museum of Glass has an example of these and you can see they put it on the cover of their uh, Journal of Glass Studies and uh, it is uh, in operation here. These were extremely expensive. Uh, the uh, less expensive version sold for uh, $18. And in the 1870s that was a huge amount of money because you figure the, you know, laborers were making about a dollar a day at that time. The most expensive versions went for $50. Uh, they were much larger than this, and they incorporated plant stands and a double bowl so that you could have fish swimming around in them. <laughs> Haven't seen one of those yet, but we've seen original advertisements for them. Well, part of that Victorian um, effort to try and bring nature into the, uh, into the parlor. This is a uh, advertisement from the DeFries and Sons uh, company in London that descended in the Shirley papers. And uh, we assume from this that Frederick Shirley uh, here in Mount Washington was probably familiar with these um, fountains through his contacts in, um, in London. This is another spectacular piece of early cut Mount Washington glass. 
It looks like a fountain, but it's actually just a big decorative table centerpiece. Uh, these are called a perns. And this piece uh, descended in the Shirley family. The story in the family was that they used it only twice a year, um, Thanksgiving and Christmas. It comes apart into about 15 different pieces. And um, unfortunately, uh, the uh, brother of um, Frederick Shirley's granddaughter uh, broke the bottom piece in the 1960s and threw out the pieces. Uh, so uh, fortunately, she said that there was still a photograph showing the apern, and this is the photograph. Uh, the photograph is dated 1903, and it shows the apern in Shirley's dining room in his New Bedford house. Just a fantastic uh, documentation of how this, uh, how this piece of glass originally originally looked and was, was used. The house is still standing, by the way. We had a, a tour that went up there, and um, we went through there about 10 years ago. And you can still see the mantelpiece and the little recessed area and the window. Um, that's a, a, a close-up showing the diamond cut pattern. Um, the uh, Base, the missing base piece was blown by a, a glass uh, blower in New York State, Art Reed, and the pattern, you can see this is the piece reassembled but before the cutting of the, uh, of the lower piece. And then the pattern was cut by Ed Poor, who used to work for the Pierpoint factory in Sagamore, and uh, did a beautiful um, beautiful job re uh, uh, restoring this uh, important piece. And there's Ed next to his, uh, his handiwork. That's a, uh, an important piece uh, for many reasons, and one of them is that Mount Washington did not sign their cut glass. Uh, they may have used paper labels for some of it, and of course those paper labels very quickly came off. So unless you find pieces in catalog illustrations or advertisements, or unless they have family provenance like this Apern does, it's, it, it can be very difficult to attribute uh, pieces to, uh, to New Bedford. Uh, this is another little, uh, this is a little tumbler that descended in the Shirley family. It has the initials FSS. And then this uh, um, mysterious uh, date underneath, 3 July 18, 1881. We have no idea what that date uh, refers to. We know that Shirley was an officer in the glass manufacturers organization. They had um, periodic meetings and perhaps this uh, commemorates that or, or some other event, but at the moment it's a, it's a mystery for us. This uh, decanter and glass feature ruby panels engraved with the initials FS for Frederick Shirley. Uh, this, uh, these pieces you would also assume descended in the Shirley family, but in fact, they turned up in the yard sale in Connecticut. And the collector who bought them was not really familiar with New Bedford glass or even uh, fine tableware. He was a collector of bottles, but he liked them. And when, they, when he and his wife bought them, they heard the, one of the people behind the table say, oh, look, someone's buying Uncle Shirley's decanter. And they thought that was funny, you know, Uncle Shirley, woman's name, and they remembered it. And a few years later, they were going through a book on American cut glass. That's the, um, that's the engraving in that ruby panel. And they came across this goblet also engraved FS with the, um, with the ruby, and it is described as part of a presentation table service for Frederick Shirley that was made here in New Bedford. Um, this was owned uh, in the collection of the author, Albert Christian Ravy. Uh, when he passed away, his collection was sold at auction down in Pennsylvania, and we do not know where this is, um, and we assume that there were probably many other pieces in this table service, but none of them have turned up yet except for those, uh, those two pieces that I just showed you. Now, I mentioned um, 
the decorative uh, art glasses that were made here in New Bedford. Amberina was probably the um, first of the um, really commercially successful art glasses. It was patented both by the New England Glass Company in East Cambridge and the Mount Washington Company. There was a huge lawsuit over it. Uh, Mount Washington lost the lawsuit, but they were able to continue production under a different name, so they had to change the name from Amberina to Rose Amber. Uh, this is a, a trade catalog page that descended in the Shirley Papers. It does not have a factory name on it, and originally it was assumed that this was a Mount Washington um, uh, catalog because it was in the papers with Frederick Shirley. But we've subsequently learned that Shirley was pulling together a lot of stuff to document um, the competition and to build his, his court case. And uh, we now know that this is actually the uh, Amberina that was being made up in East Cambridge. Burmese glass was another hugely successful art glass that was developed um, by Frederick Shirley here in New Bedford. It was patented in 1885, shading from that delicate salmon pink down to the translucent yellow. Uh, there are some great examples of it in the new display that uh, was just uh, uh, put up in the, in the lobby here at the museum. And um, Shirley, the savvy promoter that he was, sent a gift of this glass to Queen Victoria. Uh, the Queen uh, wrote a thank you letter back to him, of course not the Queen herself, uh, Colonel uh, thus and such, uh, on her behalf, and uh, that's another uh, document that Shirley used to promote his glass, uh, and he called this uh, Queen's Burmese. Uh, he also made a gift of four Burmese vases in 1886 to President Grover Cleveland and, uh, and his wife when they were married in the White House, and that was another gift that he got a lot of mileage out of uh, and uh, uh, really helped to uh, promote uh, this new glass that he developed. And it was extremely popular for the next, uh, next several years. This is a originally, a original advertising uh, flyer from the Shirley Papers that descended in the Shirley family. Here's a Burmese plate in the Hawthorne Blossom pattern. I have a nice collection of Burmese here at the Whaling Museum. This one uh, descended in the Shirley family. And this is one of the uh, two or three patterns that was uh, presented to Queen Victoria. Here's another little mystery. Um, this is the thank you letter that Grover Cleveland wrote to the Mount Washington um, factory acknowledging the gift of the four vases. So you could see it has the return address, Executive Mansion. It's um, addressed Mount Washington Glass Company, New Bedford, Massachusetts. The odd thing about this letter is that the cancellation mark does not overlap the stamp. And there are some cancellation marks on the stamp, but they're not continued onto the envelope. A couple of these letters have turned up. They have one here at the Whaling Museum, in the Whaling Museum's collection, and seven or eight of them turned up in the family collection. And what we think, there is one original, and all of the rest of them are duplicates that were probably made by Shirley himself and circulated to promote this, uh, uh, this gift that he, he made and the acknowledgement from the President of the United States. A Burmese vase um, in a very distinctive form. Um, this is the shape of a Chinese porcelain vase that sold for $18,000 in 1886. And you have to believe that this made the newspaper headlines. Um, there was uh, a huge, huge uh, outcry about, uh, about this. And, um, of course, a lot of the glass factories wanted to reproduce this because it became instantly a famous, a famous object. Um, it came from a Mary Morgan's collection. Um, 
and the original uh, Chinese vase. And so this is known to collectors as the Morgan vase. Uh, this is the only example that we know of in Burmese. Most of the uh, um, reproductions of this vase were made in Wheeling, West Virginia. Um, Here is an opaque white vase, um, also attributed to New Bedford. Here is a Chinese uh, porcelain uh, version. This is not the original. The original ended up in, um, in Baltimore, Maryland. And um, that's on view now at the museum down there. A pair of... Uh, Morgan vase shapes from Sandwich. Here's a European example. This one was made for the Chicago World's Fair, 1893. And it features this um, transfer print decoration. This one is from our collection of the Glass Museum's collection of American historical glass. We have about 500 pieces of this glass on view at uh, New Bedford City Hall. <coughs> Um, so if you have a chance to get up there, uh, it's probably the most extensive collection of uh, American political glass on public display right now. Now with the decoration of the transfer print, um, that would have been applied to the surface of the glass after it had been um, blown and, and cooled, annealed, and then put back into a kiln to permanently fuse that, uh, that print to the surface of the glass. Mount Washington also had a large decorating department where they would paint colored enamels onto the glass after it had cooled and then put it back in the furnace to uh, fuse those colors permanently. Um, a couple of the lines of art glass that featured this, uh, Crown Milano glass, which we see here, uh, made in the 1880s and 90s. Uh, Royal Flemish, there were a whole series of these art glasses. They had uh, quite a large group of decorators here uh, painting decorations on them. Uh, this particular one is known to collectors as the Guba duck motif. Uh, Frank Guba, one of the best uh, known of the, of the uh, Mount Washington decorators. And here is a uh, covered box. It's about eight inches in diameter. Uh, featuring this uh, design with the monk drinking from the stein. And this is signed by Guba. Show you the, here's the um, close-up. Most of the decorators did not sign their wear here. Um, it was really, um, in glass, it was the 1893 Chicago World's Fair that popularized the idea of signing factories glass so that every piece became a little advertisement for your company. And um, it did happen more often in pair point with the lamps than, than with other things. But um, these decorators, we think of them today as great artists, and of course they were. But they were also working on a production line, and they were turning out this glass uh, quickly, and um, uh, many, many of the companies were not having them sign their work. Here's an example of a Royal Flemish glass. Uh, produced here in New Bedford in the 1890s. It's glass like this that um, won New Bedford the, um, the reputation as being the art glass headquarters of the country. And uh, that reputation is celebrated uh, by collectors today. This glass is just extraordinarily highly thought of um, in museums, collections, uh, decorative art circles. And it's something that uh, New Bedford really um, has been and should be very proud of. The uh, design inspiration behind Royal Flemish was the stained glass windows. That's what they were imitating with the background uh, segmentation of the, of the pattern. And you'll see a couple of great examples, including um, a, a tall vase in the display that was just put up uh, in the lobby here with a net and fish uh, going up into the, into the net. Fairpoint lamps. Um, this scene showing New Bedford Harbor with the distinctive buildings from Fairhaven uh, visible across the in the uh, um, background of the scene here, uh, just outstanding. Uh, there's a great example of this lamp in the uh, 
in the Whaling Museum's collection. And that, of course, will be featured in the reinstallation of glass that uh, will open in September. In the 1920s and 30s, well, let me back up just a little bit. Um, in 1880, the Pearpoint um, Silver Plate Company was established in New Bedford by the same group of, of individuals who were the owners of the glass factory, but it was a separate company. And the original idea was that they would produce the metal mounts and, and um, holding pieces for the glass. Uh, of course, they also did flatware and, and many, other, um, many other forms. And the metal company actually became more successful than the glass company. So in 1894, the two companies were brought together uh, under the Pearpoint name. Um, and it, then in the, um, in the early 20th century, they started the production of the lamps, which is, um, I think, the, the most uh, celebrated of the Pearpoint products. In the 1920s and 30s, the style um, produced here in New Bedford uh, shifted from that Victorian uh, decorative art glass to a more Scandinavian aesthetic. Um, they were competing in this period with Steuben, with the Steuben Glass Company up in New York. And um, very high-end glass, very expensive. They were pretty much right on the same, um, same level as Steuben. And this is a typical example, the chalice vase. Uh, they used the bubble ball uh, component in many of their different uh, products, uh, but especially in the, uh, in the chalice faces. And you can find these in a wide range of colors and, and uh, decorative engraved engravings and, and color treatments. Here's another example of this pair point from the 19, uh, 1920s and 30s. Uh, Pearpoint did run into trouble uh, during the period of the Great Depression. Uh, they underwent a couple of uh, reorganizations. Um, they became the um, 1937, the Gunderson uh, Glass Company, and then um, that later became the Gunderson Pearpoint Works. Uh, the factory finally closed in 1957. The, um, end of the Second World War brought a, a huge wave of uh, European products, very inexpensively priced, and uh, we think that that is really the, uh, the reason for the, the closing of the, of the factory. These are some of the most distinctive uh, forms, and um, they were produced uh, as a very time-consuming uh, process where a, a layer of ruby glass was plated over colorless glass and the candlestick form was blown. It was, so it had a solid ruby socket at that point. It was then annealed, cooled, so that it wouldn't, it wouldn't break, sent to the cutters, and the ruby glass was ground away with stone wheels to create this, um, this red swirl pattern. It was then sent back to the furnace, reheated, and a gather of clear glass was, was, um, was uh, gathered over the ruby to create a, a sandwich with this ruby swirl in the center. It's a, a, a Graal technique that was used both by Steuben and also by the Scandinavian companies, but incredibly time consuming. And it's one of the reasons why you don't see much of this glass around. You are getting sleepy. <laughs> uh, all right, this will wake you up then. Um, I'm just going to finish up with some, um, some quick slides of another uh, company that was active in, um, in New Bedford. It was the Smith Brothers Decorating Firm. Uh, they, Smith Brothers were originally uh, hired by the company to run the decorating department of the factory. Um, about 1870, and a few years after that, they uh, set up their own decorating department and um, used uh, blanks that were being produced or blown at the Mount Washington factory to apply this painted decoration, uh, crushed enamel colors that were then 
uh, fused uh, in a kiln to the glass. Um, here they are. They both worked with their father, William, for the sandwich glass uh, uh, company originally, and uh, then went up to, to South Boston and then down to New Bedford. This building look familiar? It's right around the corner here on William Street. Uh, building still stands. The Smith brothers also had a display at the Centennial. It was right next to the Mount Washington Company. Uh, they uh, produced a lot of uh, lampshades, lighting goods. Uh, you can see um, both um, vases and uh, lamps in this illustration. Here's a trade card. Um, the conical shaped shades with the ring necks were something, were a design that was innovated here and uh, New Bedford became famous for. Uh, they also produced that in a vase form and we'll see some of those uh, in a minute. Here's an example of a decorated cone shade. Uh, we saw this slide earlier with the glass table, um, and it says Mount Washington Glass Works down at the bottom. The Smith Brothers uh, display is the one right next to it uh, under that dark sign. Some of the ring vases, those cylindrical vases with the, uh, the double rings. Here's an example, uh, Mount Washington ring vase. Uh, they also were made, this shape was also made in sandwich. Um, but the uh, Mount Washington ones have a very um, distinctive underside of these cleat marks that were used to turn the glass while it was in the mold. Uh, ring vase was originally uh, conceived as a, or inspired by, the bamboo brush holders used by artists in China. Uh, China and Japan, um, those styles were very, very influential, very popular in the States in the 1870s, and uh, particularly in the decorations that were done here in New Bedford. Two examples, the uh, vase with the parrot is about 14 inches high. It's an enormous, uh, enormous piece of glass. These are the cleat-like marks on the underside. The sandwich ones didn't have these. They're just smooth on the bottom, so it's a uh, Good way to, to tell the difference. Here's an illustration from a um, Smith Brothers catalog, 1880s. The uh, stork uh, was a very popular motif here. And this is a fascinating feature. Um, a few of these storks have feathers that were made with a fingerprint. The decorator put his finger in the little black paint and just touched it right on the, uh, on the wing. I've only seen a few of those, but uh, we'll have to get some forensic people to look at these. Maybe we can find out who, who did it. <laughs> Another uh, difference between the Mount Washington and the sandwich examples, um, sandwich did not use any of, any of the white enamel paint. Uh, for the white areas of the design, they would just scrape through so that you could see the white glass behind it. But you can see with this bird, it has a very heavy white enamel detailing painted on it, and uh, that's another uh, distinguishing feature. I'll finish up with a series of uh, Mount Washington pieces that were um, inspired by the art of English um, children's literature illustrator Kate Greenaway. Uh, Kate Greenaway published her first book of children's rhymes and, and um, illustrations in 1878. It was called Under the Window. Uh, it popularized this uh, very distinctive style of, um, of figures and she was widely copied in all sorts of media, um, silver, wallpaper, uh, um, ceramics, glass. Uh, New Bedford had quite a large line of Kate Greenaway designs. And this one was uh, decorated at the Smith Brothers uh, factory and you can see they've signed it on the side here. 
We've gone through quite a few of the Kate Greenaway publications and identified some of the original illustrations. Patty on the fence. Here's a, here's a little more elaborate one, uh, three children fishing on a bridge. Uh, we were surprised with the original um, design to see that the, the Mount Washington decorators changed this quite a bit to accommodate the vase shape. Here's the original with just two children, but they wanted the vase, the, the image to stretch around the entire front of the vase, so they They added the, uh, sorry, they added the third child. Uh, this is one of the paper labels that they used. Um, very few of these survive, of course. Um, cleaned off many years ago. Here's another one of children playing with the hoops. Oops. And here's the original. Uh, original verse, bowl away, bowl away, fast as you can. He can fastest, he who can fastest bowl, he is my man. Up and down, round about, don't let it fall, 10 times or 20 times, beat, beat them all. <laughs> and uh, this is, uh, we'll finish with, uh, with yet another mystery. Um, this is a scene, this older child with his arms uh, spread out and the little girl cowering behind him, the barking dog. Uh, it's turned up on five or six different vases that we've found to date. And in the other vases, uh, instead of having the road sign there, you see a, a stork or a group of geese or a scarecrow, things that are, are conceivably um, alarming to the, uh, to the children. Uh, we have not been able to find this in the Kate Greenaway, uh, original Kate Greenaway illustration, so we don't know what the story is behind this, this interesting scene. Um, but this particular vase uh, turned up uh, in Connecticut, and um, it is a unique example of the decorators here, uh, playing around with the, um, with the designs and, whoops, and we're especially happy to have it, of course, because the sign says, to New Bedford. And um, we, of course, are, are anxious to encourage um, everyone out there to come to New Bedford to see the incredible glass that was made here. Um, and, um, this is, uh, this is one of the great, uh, great icons. Um, if anyone has any questions, happy to try and uh, answer them for you. Yes, question in the back. It's uh, over near where the fire museum is, uh, you know, up pretty close to the top of the hill there, and um, it, yeah, I, I, I can't remember the name of the, the actual address of the street is written on the, uh, of the house is written on the back of the photograph, 1903. All right, well, thank you very much.